Right, so when groups go bad. Uh, there was the marshmallow challenge. Nice, two marshmallow challenges. One's about controlling yourself and the other one is about building a tower for marshmallows. Well, the one I want you to think about is the building a tower for marshmallows. So you're given spaghetti and tape and various other things. And you can build a structure to put a marshmallow on. And in a, a usual year, we would sit down and build one of those towers. And what would happen is people forget how heavy a marshmallow is compared to how flexible a piece of uh, spaghetti is. So what they do is build a very tall tower with no kind of rigidity to it. And then they put a marshmallow on the top and it falls over. So what happens is if you give small children uh, things to do, to do this experiment, what they would do is play around with the materials and experiment. So they won't sit there and go, ah, oh, let's construct a plan and let's uh, let's construct this massively tall, very thin tower of spaghetti and then put the marshmallow on the end, top at the end. They'll keep experimenting, including the marshmallow in their experiments. They will prototype and work out a solution. So the same is true of the tasks I've just given you. What you could do is spend from now until Thursday thinking about what's the best way of doing that particular thing and then actually start doing it. Or you could just head off each individually and do some things that you think are useful along that step and then share and pull that information of what you've done with the rest of your team and say, oh, I found this, I think it works really well. Or, and if somebody says, oh, I did it like this, and they say, I couldn't figure out how, what was needed. So the people who are getting forward on the task help the others that aren't getting anywhere on the task. And you all explore until you come up with a solution. Now, the closer you are to the assessment submission deadline, the higher the stakes, the bigger your stress, and the less functional you will be as a team. Now, I have seen this in every team imaginable. So if you have a stop clock attached to a task, as that clock ticks down, everyone gets nasty with one another. It just turns into a complete and utter train wreck. So we did this event called Biotechnology Yes, where we had to we were put in a hotel by the BBSRC. And we had to go to this hotel and come up with a business plan and present it in front of dragons, like Dragon's Den. And each university team that participated, you've been given several weeks to come up with your business plan. And then you had were given classes on how to do the to do a business plan properly, your profit and loss and all the other stuff. And then you had to present it. And the amount of tension it got amongst us as a group of PhD students working on this, so that people had to leave the room and we were shouting and screaming at each other. As it got closer to the deadline and working all the way through the night, because we'd not correctly approached the task. If you do it with plenty of time and everybody really functioning well as a team and not everyone trying to be a leader, then usually it gets done. But leaving it to the last minute, it'll be a mess. So imagine we have this team. We have Fred, who can do some programming. We have Velma, who's pretty good with SPSS and can do the stats. Um, so she understands the maths behind things. Daphne, she can draw a great design and presentation. She's got the perfect color scheming and she can definitely make the best possible website. You've got Shaggy. Well, not quite sure what he's got as his skills, 
but uh, usually the rest of the team use him as bait and he does make good sandwiches. And then there's Scooby. Now Scooby, again, he's a mascot. You can use him as bait. And again, he makes good sandwiches, so long as you like them spicy. So you've got a research question. So they decided, look at how H5N1 subtype has spread in Africa. So they come up with a plan. There you go. We're going to collect the African sequences. We're then going to make an alignment. We're going to make a phylogenetic tree. We'll come to that later. We're going to place the sequences on a map. We're going to show how the virus has spread over time. We're going to see if there's an, a mechanism for the spread, as in, uh, are wildebeest spreading it or is something else spreading the flu around? And maybe we're going to look at antigenic uh, drift. Is the sequence changing as it moves from one country to another? All nice. Great plan. What have they stopped and not done to start with? Anyway, so what they do next is the typical thing that every team does, and it's like shooting yourself in the head. So they decide Daphne's going to write the report. So she sits on her hands while she's waiting for the material to arrive to write the report. Fred's going to create the Google Maps. So he's sitting on the hand, his hands until he gets the data supplied to him, which he can use to construct the maps, which is showing which sequences in which country, on which time, in which, in which year, on which date. Shaggy's going to find the sequences and find the original data. And Scooby, well, he's just going to, he's got pause. He can't type. He's not going to do anything useful. So what actually happens? Shaggy makes a sandwich, gets addicted to Scooby snacks, and we never see anything of him ever again. Now, there are no sequences, so Velma can sit bored out of her mind. She can't do any sequence analysis, alignment, phylogenetics, or anything else. Nothing happening. Fred and Daphne can go and play Overwatch for five weeks. Fred can get annoyed with Daphne because she can play better than he can, because men don't like the women are better players. There's no map, there's no wiki, the project's a disaster, they get to repeat their second year because they haven't done anything. Now, even at the point of doing their plan, they've done something catastrophically stupid before they even start. First thing you do in that case of that project is you go to the database and you look at the African sequences to make sure that there were some H5N1 sequences from Africa. You'd find there aren't outside of Egypt and maybe one or two in South Africa. So it's a complete and utter waste of a project from the start. It's not achievable. But because you didn't look at your marshmallow and you didn't explore the data and you just didn't plunge straight in and try doing some things, you didn't succeed. You were always doomed to failure. So how you need to do it is everyone's involved in finding the sequences. So send everyone off, get everyone to do some kind of searches. Some people will be successful because they find things. Some people won't. Then you bring that back to the group and you say, oh, look, we found this. Or we didn't. Or I found 100. Oh, you found 110. Where are the extra 10 from? What did you use? How did we change this query? Oh, you used that database. Oh, I use this database. Oh, you used this aid. You've got 1,000 sequences. Well, that's more than both our hundreds by diversifying the plan and experimenting you'll do fine you can't get it wrong the only thing that's wrong is not getting any kind of solution a partial solution is a lot better than none everyone does the alignment so you have one person run off and they do the alignment but what happens if they didn't know how to use the program properly and did it wrong if you're all doing it you go yeah we all got the same result Therefore, either you all got it wrong or you all got it right. Hopefully, you all got it right. What happens if three of you get one result and one gets a different one? Well, you have to think about why did that person get something different? Document everything you did. Did you change any settings in any of the programs that you were using? At the start, leave everything as it's set. As you get more experienced, you can tweak things. 
but don't start tweaking things until you actually get through a process of doing without doing any tweaking. Uh, then you're going to do tree analysis. Now, there are a million tree creating programs. You can do it with Mr. Bayes, you can do it with Beast, you can do it with Filip, you can do it with, I can't remember, or the other Bayesian one. There's just endless things. You can try it with lots of different evolutionary models. You can have HKY, you can have general time reversible uh, mutations, depending on the size of your data set. There's loads of things you can experiment. So by the time you've done this, there are thousands of different ways you could have done it. Now, which one's the best to use? Don't know, that's the fun thing. There are things, so for a start, the settings on each of the programs will be set to quite optimal. I would not use uh, cluster W to do alignment, I would use muscle. But later we'll introduce some other programs you can use to do alignment, which are uh, MAFT and cluster Omega. Uh, some of them say that they are better than muscle, but how would I know if a program's the best anyway? How do I critically evaluate and determine this is definitely the best one? It's not, uh, there's no unique, this is definitely the best solution. Because it will depend on the set of sequences you've got and the particular protein you're after. So it's a bit different. So how it would be done, Velma and Fred work on the maps, Daphne and Shaggy go to the library to find out about how influenza spread, looking at airports, patterns, railroads, all sorts of things, geography. Everyone writes the final report. Daphne spends some more time on design than everyone else because that's her speciality. Shaggy tidies things up at the end, team finishes early, everyone gets a first class. successful and good project teams finish well in advance of the time that I've actually set you. The ones that struggle are the ones that are still working on it up till midnight or up until the one o'clock deadline on the particular submission day. They are the teams that are struggling and those are people who will never talk to one another ever again, which is why they're assigned randomly, because otherwise it's a way of ending a beautiful friendship. Remember, it doesn't hurt if your plans change, they should do depending on what you're finding things out. Uh, they also forgot to say which segment they're working on, their H5N1, there's 5,156 sequence systems, but there's 662 neuraminidases and 12,000 from there. But almost every one of them from Egypt. So having a map which shows the spread of H5N1 through the whole of Africa is pointless. You could create a map which shows it spread through Egypt, but only if the data contains specific locations. So if the data just says Egypt, that's not very useful. But if it has map coordinates from a GPS, then you can do very specific things. Old data just used to say which country it came from. It came from Vietnam. More recent data, particularly from China, tells you which one of the distinct Chinese subregions it comes from. Eventually, in the future, data will come with GPS. So when people collect a biological sample, they'll have their phone with them and they'll record where they collected the sample. As we get more advanced, we get better at collecting our data. So the data from the 70s is quite honestly awful, uh, totally useless. Um, what will happen is the phylogenetic tree will show a big change in the hemagglutinin in between before year X and after year X. And this is when Guangdong arrives from China into Egypt, which is quite recently. The neuraminidase doesn't show the same break in the years. So this allows you to say that something's been introduced from outside Africa uh, that's changed the H5 from another country. So that would be an interesting finding. It's not the one that you originally set out to do, 
but it's important nevertheless.